Welcome to the January 2018 Republican Men's Club Luncheon in Reno, Nevada. Today's speakers are student Nathan Teal, Nevada Secretary of State Barbara Snasky, Nevada's controller Ron Kanesh, and Reno meritorial candidate Eddie Lorton. To start off, I've been around since I was like five years old. Um, thanks to my mom for bringing me here. I really appreciate it. Love you, Mom. Um, but you may have seen me on your doorstep since I was five, or at events like this, or even on the legislative floor. Um, but I'm here today to mainly start talking about things that pertain to the youth. One of the biggest things that I've seen is the marijuana. Uh, to start off, at Demonte Ranch High School, where I currently go, uh, recently there was a student who walked into class smelling heavily of marijuana. And I said, I shouldn't have to smell this. The teacher walked over, she smelled it, and she left. Coming back several minutes later with the dean of students who removed the student from the classroom. I found out later that he was only suspended for having four rolls of marijuana on him and several dabs of PCP. And he was only suspended for three days. Shortly after, he was allowed back in school, but he's only allowed back in school after he gets a uh, backpack search daily. That doesn't stop him. He still brings several p things of weed daily. He always smells like it. And the rules are not working at all for that. Now, I'm on to leadership. Being on the Nevada Youth Legislator, I give, am the next generation of leadership for Nevada. Uh, Sorry, John, a little bit of a blank here. I have a definite passion for being a leader. Uh, it's been in me since I was a little kid. I've always wanted to be a leader. I enjoy taking over an audience and captivating them sometimes. And then I always like to follow in footsteps for oh some wheeler. God. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, with my leadership at the Nevada Youth Legislator, we each get a bill to submit and it will be voted on throughout our party and decided on by the end of the first term coming up here in next November, next February, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Um, but my bill idea is to make it mandatory to take one defensive driving course to, in order to get your uh, state issued driver's license. I have found, thank you, thank you very much. Hmm? Well, thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, to, can you, to, to continue on that statement, I have decided since in the past one of my predecessors put in a similar bill, but that predecessor decided to make it mandatory for only one Driver, defensive driving course, and that was Driver's Edge. Um, I have worked with Driver's Edge throughout the past couple months and several other different programs, and I've decided to make it a community pool of, of funding. So whoever has the most students successfully pass through their course within a certain allotment of, um, allotment of time, they will get the most funding for that term. And I feel that this program could be a very, very good thing for the state because I've seen that the students who have gone through have gotten in significantly less accidents than the students who just got their license and drive. They are also become a lot smarter because at, the, at Driver's Edge, they teach you that for every single person you have in your car, for one person, it's 70% likely to get into an accident. For two people, it's 130%. And adding on 70% for as many people as you have in your car, making it almost inevitable to get into a car accident. And recently, uh, this hit near and dear to my heart, the car accident that happened in Carson City a couple months ago that killed one person and s that killed one and possibly two and left several others permanently scarred for life. And it wasn't just stupid driving that they were doing. They weren't being stupid. They were all just piling into a car and driving down the road and they made the one of the driver, I don't know exactly if it was the driver or if someone else came on and hit them, but they hit a tree and flung one of them from the car. 
Also, in Driver's Edge, they teach you before they even send you out in the course a, vi a story from down in Vegas several years ago of several teenage girls who left their school at lunchtime to go and just drive to, to a restaurant to get some food before they come back. And coming back, one of the girls looked over for one second, and when she looked back, she was swerving into a tree. She yanked too hard on the wheel and spun into a tree, splitting the car in half, killing one, leaving the rest physically injured for life. I feel that this bill will make a very big difference in this community. It will definitely reduce car accidents in teenagers under the age of 18, and it'll reduce the insurance costs, which is, I like that a lot. Let's just have really high insurance. For me, it doesn't, isn't very fun. But in closing, uh, I'd like to say thank you all for letting me come up here and speak. I really appreciate it. And um, if you, yes. From the school or to get them into drug rehabilitation classes so that they're done. We're running a little bit late, and if you have questions, you can get a hold of Jennifer or Nathan, and I'll be glad to answer them. Barbara is kind of on a tight schedule, and I promise she'll be out of here by 12.30. Next speaker is Barbara Sagaski with her Pearls of Wisdom on Secretary of State. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for having me here. I have a GoEd meeting, one of the meetings that I'm with the governor and other uh, um, officials that are on the, uh, those different committees that I'm on. So I have to get back to that, and that's the only reason. And, and when we changed the date, I told him that I had to be gone on that particular day at a certain time, and he was fine with it. So I hope you're all good with it. Just know that the Secretary of State's office, which I am so pleased to be your Secretary of State, the office is open to all of you. If you ever want a meeting, ever want to come and talk, if you have an issue, something you heard, you want clarification, we are open and we are eager to help and make sure that you have the correct information. Sometimes there is information that is not factual that gets out there and we're here to help anybody that needs help with that to know what the truth is and to make sure that you have all the facts. So uh, with that said, when you come to my office, which is the most um, beautiful office in the Capitol, just to let you know, it really is gorgeous. And um, we believe that the office of the Secretary of State belongs to the people of the state of Nevada. When I was in the legislature, I felt the same way about my offices there as well. And it's always open. When we uh, would talk to lobbyists, we would listen to both sides and then evaluate and find out uh, what is best for the people of the state of Nevada. I've carried that to the Secretary of State's office, and that's exactly what I do um, there as well. Make sure my principles and my ethics are still there, and they are. And I'm starting my fourth year. Uh, it has been a uh, very fast three years, I have to tell you. Time goes by fast when you're having fun. But I have to tell you that I've got the best team, the best group of people working with me in all eight divisions. We have a wonderful staff, so we're here to help you. Our elections deputy, Wayne Thorley, um, I would love to have him come and talk at any time you want to hear any more about elections. I'll answer any questions that I can today. But just for any of you that are here and working with candidates or are a candidate, just want to make sure that you know the judicial filing is closed. That was open from the 2nd to the 12th of January. That's closed now. And then we have the non-judicial, which starts uh, March 5th and goes through the 16th. So those of us that are running for re-election, which I am, and I'm very proud to say that, Bob will have to file. Thank you. <laughs> You'll have to file. So um, we just want to make sure that everybody knows about the dates. Um, we just had uh, the filing close Friday for your uh, financial disclosure, plus anything to do with um, your um, reporting, all of the reports that you have to do, your C&Es. Those were all due last Friday. So um, it wasn't me, but the legislature does put penalties on those. So um, you, you have to adhere to those. Um, we do uh, know that there are willful uh, violations, and we do take those serious. 
but I have to tell you, generally people make honest mistakes. So that is one of the things that we're really grateful for is that we at least have that leeway. Now, for all of you who don't know, the primary uh, is uh, June 12th, and the general election is November 6th of this year. So those dates should um, hold fast for you. You should hang on to those. And know that we have um, the weeks before that we have early voting, that that happens, and there's community centers now in uh, Las Vegas, they didn't need um, a law. Uh, it uh, already is in there that it gives them entitlement to make voting centers and community centers. So I think you'll see it in Washoe County and Clark the most. So just so you're aware of that. Um, we, as you know, have 17 counties. We work very closely with the clerks. There's 15 that are elected, and there are two that are appointed by the county. Uh, Clark County and then Washoe County, they appoint their, their people. And we work very closely with all 17 of them, answer questions, help them. Uh, this last legislative session, we were able to get $8 uh, million from the legislature to help pay 50% of all the machines, uh, except for Clark. Clark did not get 50% because they've got all the money, I've heard. So. With that said, I'm just kidding. They had um, already set aside their money, and what they are doing is um, paying for their equipment. They've already ordered it. They already had it all set up. And so all the other counties are starting to receive theirs. They're getting training. Uh, the vendor that we went with is very cooperative. We're really um, happy about getting the new equipment because of the problems that can arise from having older equipment. And that's what we had was outdated equipment and we need to stay up with technology. Any of you who have bought a new car, you know that old saying that the minute you drive it off the lot, it depreciates. Well, that's kind of the same way with any, any type of technology. It changes so fast. So we're, we're keeping up uh, with all that. We're very excited about this uh, next election uh, coming up, not only because I'm running, but because we have so many um, advantages with this new system. And so we're really excited about that. And anybody that wants to tour uh, any of your districts, they love to bring people through and show you the tours. They also have meeting rooms. Um, we also at the Secretary of State's office are offering any training. That was the one thing in our, um, one of our bills. Uh, we got seven of our eight bills passed. Uh, the one uh, that was 40, AB 45, the one thing that they would not allow us to have was that to mandate training and certification. In 2016, our biggest concerns and biggest complaints and where we uh, were able to catch some not so good players was through the voter registration forms that were done illegally and then also through the signature gathering for the petitions. So we wanted that to be mandatory, and unfortunately, they didn't acquiesce to that. But we did put a training program online at the Secretary of State's office, so you can see it on our website. Uh, we worked really hard to get that done, so anybody can use that. We also will come to wherever you are. If you're going to be holding something, we will come and help uh, with any training that you uh, see that you need. I know about Clark County's because I've seen Joe's, I've been to Joe's trainings, I've seen what he's done uh, down in Las Vegas. Uh, Re or, uh, Washoe County does the same in, in Reno. Um, they really do a good job. They know the current laws and that's one of the things that we've had a little bit of issue with is um, people say, yes, I know how to register a voter, but do you know all of the nuances uh, that the legislature passed? Because every session, something does get passed. I, I'm just telling you, I think uh, Assemblyman Wheeler will agree with me that nothing ever stays the same. <laughs> so with that said, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to know about the training, if you want to know about any of the issues, please contact our office. We're more than happy to answer any questions. We do a lot of answering questions, and on um, Monday, or well, Tuesday of this week, because Monday was a holiday, we got so many calls about the CNEs and asking us, uh, did I report this right? Uh, was I late? Um, am I going to be late if it's after 5? It was till midnight. Um, when there's a holiday that falls, it's usually the next day, so it was that Tuesday. But we had full team access. <laughs> everybody was on the phones all day long answering questions on, on Tuesday. So we think everybody's in. 
Um, and if anybody has any issues or questions, please let us know. I've talked to some gentlemen in the back that have businesses, and I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you uh, about that. We have an ESOS rewrite that we're doing that I'm really excited about that we got funding for. And what we're doing with that is we are upgrading the business licensing procedures. And so Silver Flume, does anybody know about Silver Flume? Yes. Silver Flume is an excellent way to go online and get everything done that you need and, and your filings. We're upgrading everything. Everything's being done. Um, it hadn't been done for a long time, so we're working on that and hope to have that finished to help uh, facilitate with the number of pa pages of paperwork that you have to go through. We're trying to uh, streamline that, and I think you'll be very happy with the end result. We've got a great team, the staff that's been working on it. It took almost a year just to put the process and um, all of the nuances that needed to be in that. It, it's a really long procedure. So um, I will leave it open for any questions yeah. you might have. You got yeah, right now, if you have questions, come up here to the front because we're recording. And she can take about 10 minutes worth of questions and then let her eat before she has to leave. <laughs> Um, I just want to tell you thank you for having me here today, Ray, and everyone. I'm so excited to be here. You can contact I have the websites. I have both the Secretary of State website. And I also have the campaign website, so make sure you know the difference between the two when you, resp when you ask questions. But we are available. I'm looking forward to a second term as your Secretary of State. So with that, thank you very much for having me here. We're going to have Carolyn take the mic around if you have questions. So put up your hand so she knows who has. Hello. Hi. Just wanted to find out what is being done through your office to ensure the integrity of voter registration as well as the election process so that uh, people who are voting are entitled to vote. Well, there's a lot to talk about that. That's a very broad question, and there's a lot that's being done. Um, I do have to tell you that there are some things I can't talk about because of an ongoing investigation. But with that said, we are um, um, high profile on this, and we are working with uh, national uh, FBI. We work with all of the law enforcement agencies, not only nationally but statewide. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, insight on um, the primary and the election day and night. We start at 6.30, 7 in the morning and go until the polls close. And what we do is all the law enforcement agencies come in. They, um, we're all seated at the table. We hear any complaints, any concerns that come in. And we also have each party there, everyone from the Democrat or the Republican Party, we have somebody that's there to represent each party. And then we find out what the issue is, if there's um, somebody that's holding a sign that's too close, um, if there's somebody that um, is um, you know, bothering people at the polls, we find out who's got the jurisdiction and the law enforcement, and then we send those <coughs> people out. So that's one of the things we do for that. Now. We found, um, as I told you, the, the registration forms are a big issue. That's a really, really big issue for us because they're, they are falsifying and some of them do not have um, correct driver's license numbers but are using them to get registered. So what are we doing? We are, um, we have, since I've been in, we have really enforced and gone up uh, several notches to look at all registration forms. We've done classes for our, not only our clerks, but our voter registrars. And in telling them what they can and can't do, what we're looking for, what are some of the obstacles, and then the clerks talk to us about what they see, because that's where we get most of our in, input from, is that they see forms that um, aren't signed correctly, don't have proper um, identification, don't have correct addresses. So they look at all of that and then they'll contact the person and say, um, you know, we couldn't read this on your form. Can you please send back this card or call us? And then if we don't get any um, acknowledgement or have any feedback, then they don't vote. So there's a lot of things that we're doing, and we'd be more than happy at the office to have you come down and talk to you about um, everything that we're doing. We did uh, prosecute 
somebody in Pahrump. We have two others. The one in Pahrump was for the registration forms, and she is, uh, the judge had sentenced her. Um, the other ones, the other two that we're working on right now, um, they have to do with the initiative petition signatures. So we have um, three admitted uh, cases um, that we're working on, and then we're working on, on the lists. Uh, one of the things that is very important to me is to have a clean voter registration list, and we are working on that as well. Anyone I else? hope I answered your question. But you can call me, honest. You can call any time, and we'll be more than happy to answer any specifics that you have. Madam Secretary, uh, these fees to register your company are getting out of hand. Is that something in the jurisdiction of the Secretary of State? Uh, no, it's not. It's in the hands of the legislature. But I can go up, and I, I do often go up to <clears throat> voice my opinion. Um, my uh, platform when I first ran was to make sure that the filing fees um, would not be raised. I actually wanted them to go back down, and that didn't happen. But we were able to keep the first one, the business license itself, at 100, but they raised the corporate. So a lot of people came in and switched uh, to an LLC instead of a corporate. And then some people actually went to another state uh, to do business because of their filing fee costs are so much less. So it is an issue. Uh, those of us that have had businesses, I'm a former business owner, my parents were business owners, so I know the hard work that you all do and I know how it affects you every time there's a new fee or a cost to do business. And um, when you go on the silver flume, you can look at how much it costs for the county, um, how much it costs for the city. You can go in and see what the state costs are going to be. So you have an idea of what it's going to cost you to become a business person in the state of Nevada. And I, I believe that's what you're talking about. But it does come from the legislature. Just to also let you know that the, um, the original fees when they first came out, that was all done by the legislature. They needed um, funding, and so that's what came out um, several years ago was the um, funding source for the state of Nevada for the general uh, fund. We are the third largest contributor to the general fund through our business licenses. Wow. Okay, one more. One more. So I have one really quick question, um, and that is, how old do you have to be to start a PAC? How old do you have to be? Well, I haven't had that one, but I would assume you need to be a business entrepreneur, but probably 18. That's generally signing contracts is, uh, is, is normally what it is when you're signing something. Um, but I can verify that, but I would say you have to be at least 18 is, is my interpretation. But I also want to thank Nathan so much for continuing on something that's meant so much to me. I started, took me 10 years to get the full graduating driver's license. And one of the issues was um, we don't want uh, driver's license requirements because we teach people to drive tractors at 8, 10, 14, and we don't like the restrictions. And I said, well, driving a tractor in a field and driving a car on the road are like two different, <laughs> two different things. But I'm so happy that you're pursuing it. I know Jeff Payne very well. I know what he's doing. I think it's a, a great course. I don't know of any of the other ones that are doing it, but he has a, a wonderful um, uh, event that he does on a regular basis. And I've had a couple lobbyists that have come up to me a couple times and said, you know, I know I wasn't for your bill when you had it in the graduating driver's license, but I have to tell you, since my child is a teenager and starting to drive, thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you for what you're doing, Nathan. And congratulations on the um, being appointed to the Legislative Youth Forum. That is, that's tremendous um, for you. Before, thank you. Before we let you eat, okay. May Herbert, which is ambassador of goodwill, has a little, where'd she go? Has a little something for you. May is everywhere. She's yeah. actually in town, not in Japan or China or somewhere. Oh, I just got back. I know. I know. Okay, here. This is for you because come back. Thank you. You didn't get. Oh. We don't. Have. Yeah. No. No. That's okay. She. Okay. All right. Sacred. Before I forget, there's 
one of our county commissioners that just got here, Janie Herman, if you'd welcome her. Janie, stand up. <laughs> Even though he just got here because he was having a little therapy, he's getting in good shape. Ron connects up next. He has 10 minutes. And both Ron and Eddie will have Q&A from 12.30 to 1. So, and I guess Nathan's able to say, so that's great. You can ask all three of them questions. And Carolyn will go around. So Ron, without further ado, Ron Connect, our state controller. Well, thank you. Time limit, okay? What, what Mr. Wheeler said? I've become famous for uh, giving the shortest Lincoln Day speeches on the circuit. So I'm going to use up some of my time to talk first. First of all, thank you all for inviting me. It's great to be here with you all, my friends. I'm going to use up some time to tell you a story about Barbara Sagafsky. When Barbara had her first um, staff meeting the day after election, or uh, after inauguration, some of her people said something akin to, how shall we address you? And she looked sort of flummoxed. Barbara's a down-to-earth person, okay? And she says, what do you mean? And they said, well, your predecessor wanted us to address him as Mr. Secretary Miller. And she said, Barbara will do just fine. That's the kind of person you got. Now, in my case, I'm not as liberal. My staff asked me something similar, and I said, well, you got two options, okay? You can call me Ron. That's the preferred option. But if that doesn't work for you, your excellency will do just fine. <laughs> It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you three things. Uh, well, first of all, because you elected me Nevada controller, I am the official state nerd, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you three things. And then we're going to turn it over to Eddie. First thing is, I've kept all the promises that I made. We've done a great job at the controller's office. You heard about all the turmoil, the troubles, the scandals, and the firings? Of course you didn't. There haven't been any, and there won't be any. We've taken care of the day-to-day -day business. Uh-oh. Sandy's putting down her purse and getting ready for the heavy artillery. Second thing is, you know who I am. Across the board, I'm the most reliable, dependable, limited government conservative on the ballot. Now, Bob Beers back there will try to challenge that and say he is. He's a close second. Uh, Wheeler's not even in competition, okay? <laughs> That's the second thing. <laughs> the third thing is... Um, we have done a great job, and I have kept all the promises. We're working on the uh, state uh, so-called enterprise resource uh, program, replace the whole uh, state computer and uh, information system, bring it up to date after 20 years, and as part of that, uh, we're working with the Office of Administration, the Office of Finance, and all the other 140 agencies to re-engineer the business processes to make uh, the, the state run better and to serve you better. Above all, I promised we'd put the checkbook online. We're working on that, and we actually discovered some problems that we cleaned up for the rest of the state in the course of that. And finally, I said I'd save you some money and raise about, he's going to go get the shepherd's hook here and pull me, but uh, I said I'd save you some money in the first year and a half, we turned back over a million dollars versus the budget that my predecessor asked for and that the governor and the legislature approved. We cut spending in our own office by 13 percent, and I'm very proud of that. We also proposed a statewide budget that would have done something similar for the whole state, and of course the legislature what? 
said, put that in the closet, nobody talk about it. Uh, we've got a lot of spending to do and a, and a tax bill to pass, and that's what they did. So what we're going to do about that, Bob and I have been working on repealing the commerce tax, and in a couple days, in a few days, we'll have some big news for you on that. Thank you all, and God bless you. By the way, if this were a Democrat audience, I'd have to tell you that I've never been indicted. <laughs>Hi, my name's Eddie Lorton, and I'm running for mayor in the city of Reno. I'm glad to see all these nice faces here today. And my passion for running for politics, it started when I was like 25 years old, okay? I've lived in Reno my whole life. I was born in Dayton, Ohio, but we moved here when I was six months old. So I care about Reno very much and love this city. And what got me started was... At a young age, you know, you're making it. I made my money with my brain in my hands, okay? Uh, you start investing in the city and looked at properties, found some. And then uh, where it started for me was I started buying warehouses and stuff a long time ago on 4th Street. I'm buying improvement districts, okay? I have a lot of businesses. And when it came to my building strategy, I saw things that could be approved to go in. And the ones that improve the most appreciate the most. So I selected warehouses in the downtown core on 4th Street. And so then all of a sudden I was on the 4th Street Corridor Commission, okay, became you got to get active, you get involved. And part of the promises the city made to me was, okay, they're not going to have any strip clubs on the 4th Street Corridor or homeless shelters, okay. So then I ended up, bought a lot of properties at 25 years old. And then all of a sudden I turned around, and this is under Bob Cashel's tenure, and they lied, and they flopped the homeless shelters right in the middle of the downtown core, okay? So then, I would, you know, at the time you go, well, I don't want to hurt my community, so I didn't take legal action, and, and I sucked it up, and it's been a struggle ever since. And then that's what got me involved in council meetings, because then what I noticed is I went, I'm a business analyst, I see patterns, I see what works, what don't, and that's why I could be a good mayor, because I know what business is. I, how can you fix a problem? And in the first place, if you see what's going on in this administration, they can't even identify a problem. So how can you fix it if, first off, you can't even identify it? Okay. So I go in there, and so I start getting involved in council meetings. I've been to more council meetings probably than this whole uh, council Put together okay I've been doing this for 25 30 years now I had to get involved so that you could protect your investments so that's a sad thing when citizens have to get involved in government to protect their investments and that's their job is to do good for the citizens and not for them to have to get involved to protect their investments so then time went by I got more and more involved and then things occurred you could see this town's been getting fleece for over 30 years Okay, and I think it's time that stopped. If you've seen the tax and spend mentality they've had lately, it's enough to drive someone like me crazy to where here we have closed fire stations and we're renting beach whales and doing arch rehabs. This just doesn't make sense to me. I'm a finance guy. You take your budgets, you prioritize those budgets, and the only job of the city is police, fire, and public works, okay? So we're not going to be doing all these extravagant things till those needs are met. I've come up with a proposal to where this city's $400 million in debt. I did them a property disposal program with policies. This city owns hundreds of millions of dollars worth of properties that was paid for by you, the taxpayer, okay? And then there's a thing called the redevelopment agency. They use this tool so they could use your money, buy properties, and then sell it to their buddies without going to public bid at a discounted rate. And this has been um, abused for a long time in California. They even had the sense to stop the redevelopment agencies. And in Reno, they're over uh, around $35 million in debt through the redevelopment agency. So what I say, while we're on an economic upswing like we are now, that's the time to sell your properties, get the most you can, apply that money, pay off our $400 million debt, build a new police station, 
not increase your taxes. I wrote them a property disposal program in three days. They couldn't do it in two years. I'm a real estate expert, okay? I found 150 more pieces of property than the city even knew they owned. Now talk about, you know, I mean, it's just, you hate to say bad things, but it's just the incompetence level is unbelievable. So I go in, find these things. So I would like to apply the things I know. We ran last time what you know, okay? I believe in term limits. You saw, took them to the Supreme Court. We set uh, case law and term limits in this state. Blew out the whole last council. So I had eight incumbents and all their friends against me, first time runner, and it took them all to beat me, I might add. And now this time, and she had a smile. But this time, she has lots of baggage. I was right on the issues, and we'll see what happens this time, okay? So now, when it comes down to it, I need your support so we can take our city back, okay? And the thing with what's been going on at the city is from the corruption and dysfunction, from the Klinger case, if you've seen that lately, to they voted to make Reno a sanctuary city, or they called it a welcoming city code for sanctuary, okay? And the only flag I'm going to fly is the United States flag that supports veterans. So I really hope for the opportunity to put my knowledge to work for this city. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a labor of love. I didn't have any kids. This will be my legacy. Throwing my business experience and expertise is to be able to help these citizens, and I could be a 12-year mayor, I'm only 55 years old, and if they'll have me and I can gain your vote, there's three, four-year terms that I could be here and add stability to our economic upswing instead of getting the way like they do. So please, like, you know, if, you, if you've been watching the Gazette Journal, they'll do nothing for me and everything for her, and so just be aware of that, and I can't wait till debate time when we can discuss issues no one knows them like I do, and I look forward to it. So I appreciate your time today. We need your help on the election coming up, and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Boy, these guys are been a long time. Yeah. I, got, I got a question for Ed. I'm Gary Archie. Uh, you got to get in, Ed, because... Uh, I don't know if you're if you heard, but uh, San Francisco has a, a map for the people to be able to get around San Francisco without stepping on human excrement. We don't want that in Reno, Nevada. Yes, sir. And I have a plan. Okay, I I know Jamie Jeannie's here today, and I respect Jeannie and what she does, and she's with the county commission. But this is another thing. Okay. I'm a business analyst. I spot the problems, you fix them. Don't bring me a problem unless you have two cures to that problem, okay? And per the NRS laws, okay, per the county gets all the federal grants for the homeless issue, and the city of Reno keeps getting out negotiated by the county, okay? So now it's high time the county is supposed to place and pay for 100% this homeless issue. The city of Reno, Bob found a way to make money off this homeless shelter, okay? That's why they flopped it in the middle of the city of Reno. And if you're a Reno citizen, you've seen what it's done to our city. It's devastating and destroying it for property and business owners, let alone what people see when they come to our town, okay? Where I say this, okay, it's the club meant for the homeless to where they have food, lodging, 24-hour town, alcohol, drugs, prostitution. Why would they go anywhere else? So therefore... What I propose is you put it on the outskirts of town, and then they can get out of that element and truly get help so they can lead to a better life for them. So now, what I will do is to where they ended up in the past, this city ends up, they said, oh, we called them, Eddie, they don't return the call. Of course they don't. They get a giant amount for social issues, millions of dollars. And they write us a piddly million dollar a year check and we're stuck with a problem on enforcement, police, the city of Reno's trying to do a BID, a business improvement district, so they're trying to assess your properties for more police as part of this problem, okay? We have a glut of homeless in this city. So I'm saying spread it out, we all do our part, but from here on, we're at a crossroads. The county needs to take it over. We'll be stuck with, we're stuck with, as 
the Reno, you know, I look out for Reno. I'll be working for them in our budget. We're $28 million into this shelter that we are not even supposed to be paying for. So imagine that'll go a long way and open our police and fire stations. So therefore, I'm going to hold the county accountable to pay, place and pay for this issue because per the law and the NRS codes, they are responsible 100%. I'm the king of court when every time I don't say stuff unless I know we can win. And they said at the council, oh, we call them, they don't return the call. Of course not, because they're keeping this money. What I would do, like I told them, you send them a demand letter. Let's litigate, then we'll get it done. Thank you. Um, my question is for, um, well, before I actually ask the question, I'd like to uh, tell Mr. Beers that those business license fees were in great shape until 2013. They were then turned down when Secretary of State Ross Miller came uh, and asked for an increase in fees in 2013. We in the legislature turned it down. After the session, he went to the interim finance committee, which was controlled by Democrats at that time, and got those fees through without legislation. Totally illegal, but that's how the Democrats work, just so you know. But uh, my question is for Nathan T. And Nathan, I'd like to know um, what it is that you need and people like you, young people like you need, to help grow more Republicans. We all know that the Democrats grow their, Repub or their Democrats from birth. And, I mean, they really do. They indoctrinate them in the schools. They've taken over the press. It's very hard for us to um, get good rep young Republicans in until they find out that they actually have to buy their own toilet paper, you know? <laughs> but what do you need, Nathan, to, to help you get more Republicans into the uh, youth, from the youth area? So uh, to start off with the NYL, we have a program called the DIAC program. That's the District Youth Advisory Council. Each NYL member has their own council, and we appoint them from each school in our district. Meaning that with my DIAC, we're going to be traveling to every school in my district and talking to the students about the problems facing the youth and getting them converted over to our side so that they don't have to be incompetent with their decisions with the marijuana, the driving stupidly. Um, and I need donations of any kind to be able to get me there to pay for fuel, to pay for food for my DIAC. And then I'm also going to be taking leadership courses coming up here within the next couple of months and I'm also going to need donations for that as well. You keep your microphone up, please. Sorry? Keep your microphone up. Um, mainly get to the P.O. box. That we have a P.O. box that we use out in Sparks, um, and that's where we have people send the donations to. If you'd like to know more about that, I could... Definitely contact you with that. I also have a Facebook page, and that's another really great way to connect with me. Yeah, but where is it? Tell them how to get to the Facebook. Or the donation. They need to know where. Um, so for the P.O. Box, it is P.O. Box 50924 in Sparks, Nevada. And then 89435 is the zip code. And then for my Facebook page, it is my name, Nathan T, spelled T-E-A. And um, on it, you'll see a picture of me. Uh, two youth legislator T. Put the mic up, they can hear you. Sorry, youth legislator T, T-E-A. No, no. Youth legislator Nathan T, sorry. His mom is coaching him. Just a little bit. And she's a professional coach and speaker and all that good stuff. Yeah, she even keeps Wheeler in, in line. Yeah, suggestions to the youth that you know to be a part of my DIAC. So if they're within Senate District 16, whether they, uh, if they go to school there, so if they go to like Galena, Damani, Minogue, uh, any of those schools, then I can definitely, I would definitely appreciate and their recommendation.
Good. Don. <clears throat> Don, back here. Uh, the uh, there have been several articles lately regarding pension liability of states and local uh, municipalities, and depending on what metrics you use, Nevada comes out as like second, third, or fourth worst. Could you tell us what's going on there and what our future looks like in that? Happy to do so, and thank you for that question, uh, because that's been one of the causes I've been working on and will be working on uh, going forward. I went to the PERS board and I said, you're basically whistling past the graveyard, okay? What they're saying is, oh, let's assume that we're such good investors that we'll make a lot of money. Um, I, I wish I could assume that with my family's very modest uh, assets. But the two things they're doing is overestimating future returns, and, and that happens to be my specialty area. And the other thing they're doing is overestimating the number of new participants they'll have who will be contributors. So I don't think PERS is close to the worst. The worst is Kentucky, Illinois, New Jersey, et cetera. But PERS is going to get itself and get us as taxpayers and get the uh, employees and retirees into a hole like Kentucky and Illinois and New Jersey if they keep this up. What they've got to do is get realistic about what future returns they can expect. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll just be real clear about this. The number I gave them, based on my own analysis, was subsequently ver validated, verified by David Swenson, who for 32 years ran the Yale University endowment and got the highest returns of any endowment in the country. And his view is the same as mine. Going forward, things are not nearly so optimistic. We wish they were. So what PERS has got to do is get realistic about the returns, get realistic about uh, some of the demographics, and especially get realistic about the number of state employees. Otherwise, like I said, it's down the hole with Illinois, Kentucky, and New Jersey. Hello, my question is for Nathan. I'm Elizabeth Perti. And my question, Nathan, is are you over high schools only or high schools and UNR? Nathan, up here. Um, could you clarify a little bit of that? Uh, so are, are you talking and, and helping the students to understand for just the high schools in our area or including UNR, the college? So. The, my entire district, um, with the NYL, the maximum group we're allowed to go to is within the high schools. Um, but I assume that I would be able to go and speak to UNR have, had I been in their district. Okay, so the rest of my question then is, when you were talking about the marijuana problems, what are the rules or regulations regarding marijuana currently in the high schools so that you are trying to have them, what, enforce the rules or laws right now? Or are you trying to introduce new rules and regulations? Especially, I'm, I'm questioning, um, since we have legalized it in the state, um, what changes are perhaps happening in the schools, and also about medicinal marijuana usage, mm. and um, you know, possibly also your industrial hemp and usage, especially particularly the one without T, what, THC yes. in, in, um, in, you know, for medicinal purposes and, and, and not being on medication, an alternative to that. So to start off with your question, um, as for pertaining the rules at, at school, uh, they only have the rule of do not bring it, but if they bring it, there's only a suspension punishment. Um, suspension punishment and then they won't be allowed back in school until they can pass a drug test. That's all they have. Um, but I, what I want to see happen is for it to be flat out illegal to bring it anywhere. Because the current law, to my knowledge, is um, there's, no there's no marijuana allowed in public spaces, and which I would assume that that would include schools. Um, but there's still marijuana at schools frequently. 
is what I've been seeing a lot of. Um, and as for your other part of the question, I do not know, but I can definitely look it up and get back to you as soon as I can on that. My name is Jim Crocious. <clears throat> Anybody can answer this if they have the guts to do it. Every few years, we get hit with another hundreds of millions of dollars for the schools. And yet, as far as I know, Nevada ranks near the bottom, is at the bottom. But notice how many things we are at the bottom for. It seems like Nevada leads in every category that you don't want to lead in. Not to get religious, but the spirit of God is the spirit of liberty. And it seems like every time we do something at the legislature, we create more bondage for the citizens of Nevada. So when is somebody going to step up and address the real problems about the irreligiosity of our government so that the problems can be solved. That, that, thank you for that question, Mr. Crocious. That was not a plant, but uh, gee, I can't think of a better uh, jumping off point. This is the popular annual financial report from last year. The next one will be out soon. It addresses all those problems. And by the way, as I've told you all before, you better get it and read it because everything in here will be on the final exam. <clears throat> Yesterday at the uh, State Executive Audit Board meeting, I pressed the head of the K-12 system. Um, I said, we're not quite last um, in anything that involves output and achievement and accomplishment. We're close to last. Um, but here's the deal. You get these people, including the governor, including the school system, telling you, oh, we allocated a bunch of money in the last two, three years to K-12, and the future is rosy, it's going to be beautiful, and we're going to turn around this long-term problem we've got. Let me tell you something. We've been stuck at 43rd, 44th in educational achievement of our students for a long time right now. But the fact is, and this goes exactly to your point, the fact is that we haven't been starving K-12 in terms of state funding. We had a uh, legislator a few years ago who's now on your city council here in Reno say something really stupid that in his time in the legislature he had witnessed the systematic destruction of K-12 education by underfunding. It isn't so. There are only two things in the last 10 or 11 years that have grown in terms of spending in real per person terms. One is health and social services, which has grown mostly due to federal funding, and two is K-12 funding, which is coming out of your pocket from the state general fund. It has grown about 25% faster than the incomes of Nevada families and businesses. Okay, so we've been doing this for a long time, spending more and more and more on K-12, throwing it at the teachers' union, throwing it at the administrators' union, et cetera, and getting nothing for it. What we need are some policy reforms, and in the PAFR, we outline some of them, and in... Uh, our weekly column, James Smack, the deputy controller, and I, and formerly uh, Jeff Lawrence, the assistant controller, and I have outlined those, and we'll continue to do that. What we need is policy reform and parental choice in uh, K-12 education. Thank you. I would I like to also address that from a local level here. Well, his name was probably David Bobzian. <laughs> so he was one of the uh, legislators out there but I'll tell you something like it amazes me why people come here to do business in Reno and Nevada is because of our tax structure okay 
So here in Reno, the amazing part about this is the fact that if a system's broke, because I'm a business guy, you got to fix the system. Throwing money at a broken system doesn't cure the problem, okay? We had the largest tax increase of our state's history due to the commerce tax. Sandoval skated around the voters and what they voted for, and he legislatively went around everybody and made sure it got in, didn't it? So besides that, though, what your local people, like in my case, the current mayor, which this is why we're political opposites, I'm telling you. If I get in there, I'll do a great job for you, and I hope to gain your vote. But they want to get rid of, and they're sending legislators down to, to legislate for them to take away your tax cap on your property taxes, okay? Not only have you seen all these other school things get passed because you can't throw money at a broken system, it's never going to make it better. I'll, I'll mention a prime example. The head of the Clark County Schools oversees 301,000 kids, okay? And then Tracy Davis only makes $20,000 a, a year less than she does. She only oversees 61,000 kids. So if the money doesn't hit the classroom, what good is throwing good money after bad? Okay? So now what they're trying to do is take away your tax cap. You know, we had when our bubble burst in 08, I'm a properties guy. No one wrote me a subsidy check for my investments going down. But in 08, everything was plummeting, okay? That's when the bubble burst. And then they came in, and they put a tax cap on it so it could only go down 3% a year so it helped the government and not the citizens. So now that it's skyrocketing up, they see an easy pickings for them. So they're trying to get rid of your tax cap, and the, the mayor and them are in charge of this, trying to get legislators to get rid of your tax cap so that it can skyrocket up now that it's helping citizens like everybody in here that owns property. And they also want to get rid of your depreciation right off. So here's more money they're trying to do locally to throw at the classroom when the system's Don't broke. Work. So please elect me for mayor. I'll do a good job. Thank you. Well, hold hold on. Before we do something, um, I wanted to thank our servers because there was 11 people that showed up that we didn't have registered. So be patient with them. They're doing a great job. They've added an extra server. And in the future, please register. I know it's at the last minute. I appreciate everybody being here. With that in mind, I have a question for Eddie. What in the hell are you going to do about downtown? It looks like a pig sty. Like I said, city of Reno and the county is going to be having a talk. That's the best way to put it. I've got a question for Eddie also. Uh, yes, sir. Eight years on the Planning Commission, and uh, I see uh, city of Reno just expanding clear out into Mountain Springs and uh, Cold Springs and all these outside uh, areas when there's no utilities, there's no anything out there. And they have to build a corridor so they can they can meet the law about adjacent properties annexing to the city. Yes. And you know, Cold Spring, Stone Gate, uh, five thousand homes. You know, this is crazy expansion. Well, what you do, you look at who the lobbyists for these projects are. Jessica Sferraza, which is the campaign manager for the person I'm running against, okay? She's a campaign manager for Hillary, okay? And now she's became a lobbyist for the builders. And I might add, she's the only lobbyist that every single project gets approved, and she never even says a word at the meeting. Never seen that before, because she does all her work before the meeting, but I'm aware of all these things. So now, what they do, and she's also in Stonegate, so is Fiaro. They're two giant lobbyists, and, uh, and they carry weight, so they're going to be trying to shove it through. But I've given them an answer to this, but I do creative thinking, I think, outside of the box. Like, you know, all those properties I was talking about? It doesn't stress infrastructure because a lot of them, I say a blight initiative program through development, okay? Our downtown core, we got all these pieces sitting there empty Why the homeless congregate there. This is the way to clean it up. We can sell these properties off, pay off our debt, highest interest rate bond first and work ourselves backwards till we're out of debt. And then we can clean up these projects, build them out, okay? It doesn't stress our infrastructure like you're talking about. We won't need new fire stations and police stations, let alone if you come from Cold Springs, it takes hours to get into town as it is, 
okay? And then it'll also put these properties on the tax scroll, heaven forbid, and supply jobs. So they don't think the way I do, and that would be the cure, but they're gonna try to do these things. They keep putting it on the outskirts, and we do have a housing problem right now, but there's a good point. Let's don't do it fast, let's do it right, but there are answers, but it's internal, and not just do these projects because they can get land cheap out there and annex it from the county and then stick us, the spaghetti bowls needed to be fixed for how many years till that's addressed. It's just a terrible plan, I think. Thank you. I think your plant master plan and water. code. Yeah, and water, you know, I like now though, because of last year, excuse me a second, like uh, last year, you know, we got blessed, okay? All of our aquifers got filled. We're out of a drought officially in the state of Nevada, which is great. And the thing is, is now they have other ways on new developments to save water, but we do need to guard our resources for now. As far as we need a little expanding, you know, so, because when it comes to, you know, I want to be able to take full advantage of the business upswing, but every now and then when there's opportunities, the window's open, the window's open now, but then one day it closes. So we don't want to be stuck picking up the pieces in like a San Jose and stuff like that. All right, thank you. I'd like to add one thing to that. You know, the city development code already calls for infill first, and then they ignore that. Yes, and they do. One more question back here. They uh, ignore the law all the time. Thank you. And I got a, I got a question for you. I probably talk too much like my brother, but I got a question for you. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to clean up downtown first? and expand out? I mean, I'm all for, and I think that's what you were saying. Uh, I'm all for development. My business, if they do cold springs, I'll just do terrific. There's only one problem. I couldn't get my trucks there because of the highways to, to service the people. Agreed. Downtown, okay. We have infrastructure yeah. problems. Like, I'll put it this way. Here we are, we didn't need the Southeast connector, okay? Bob Cashel's old uh, truck stop there, the Alamo, ran right in front of where that was going to go. What a coincidence. And then I called him out at the meeting, said, you need to abstain from the vote. How dare you question my ethics? I said, well, okay, in this state of Nevada, the law is this. And ethics, if it even seems to be inappropriate, you're supposed to abstain from the vote. So don't you think it'd be inappropriate if him and his son runs the gaming hall there and they take in a million bucks a year and it's right in front of their casino? You bet your ass it is. So I called him on it, okay, and he voted anyway, and guess what? He voted yes. So for the NRS laws a long time ago, when you voted on these gas taxes, you know, the nickel at a gallon for a dollar fifty later, a nickel at a time. They were specifically stated on your ballot that you voted on was to go to road repair and maintenance, okay? Then they morphed it into the mega projects because all their buddies were on them. Then the Northeast Connector got built. Now they're doing the Southeast Connector without fixing our issues, and that's a spaghetti bowl, putting more lanes out in Cold Springs. And then if we don't have a grind, because I'm, I'm up for building. I mean, we need it and stuff like that, but it has to be controlled properly and handled right so our infrastructure can take it. And building's great, that's a great plan because then it doesn't, it doesn't stress our infrastructure first until those issues get addressed. So I hope they can deal with that, but it's beyond them. All they're doing is approving Jessica's projects and they ignore the rest. Thank you. All right, anybody else? I've got one more for Eddie while you're at it. Uh, what do you think about separating the uh, the city council from the mayor, where you have an actual mayor and an actual city council separate. Well, as my case law setting court case stated, she is part of the city council, okay? We set case law for term limits. And as you saw, did you see a while back when she tried to skate around what voters had voted for? The voting public voted for term limits not only once, but twice, overwhelmingly by 80%, okay? And then how about did what Sigerbloom surreptitiously, which is in a sneaky manner, went around the whole city council, which she's part of. She went around the Citizen Charter Review Committee in a year and a half of their hard work where they decided to do nothing because it wouldn't make our city ran any better. So per my case law and the city charter, she is part of the council. She tries to separate because all she's trying to do, and, and you can bet if you saw last time, 
She's trying to get rid of this court case. She's trying to change the charter. So her friend, I mean, if you can't make it in the real world, Jessica had a hard time holding jobs in the past, okay? So now she's making it in government. She's there for 12 years. Should anyone be in government 24 years? The president does eight years. And she wants to be on this city council 24 years. If that makes any sense, it doesn't to me. I think you get in there, you leave it a better place. You contribute in your own way and you move on. And they can't make it in the real world. That's why they do these things. So they're going to try to change a charter if she gets reelected to make that case. Like you stated, they're going to start to separate the mayor from the council, which this is how I look at it. I think you get a better decision when seven people make it instead of one. She tried to have Sigur Bloom, which is a senator from Las Vegas, come in last second, tried to pull a legislative move so that they could change a charter. I went in this council meeting. Okay, I went and let her have it and said, you need to at least try to salvage what last little bit of your reputation. We all seen what you're doing. She goes, I didn't know it was going around turn limits. She absolutely knew what you were doing. And I said, you need to back out of this and at least try to salvage the last little bit of reputation she could. She knew there wasn't an appetite for it, so she backed out, but we all know what she did. She tried to go around voters, what they voted for in the public, her council, the Citizen Charter Review Committee, a year and a half of their work, and we know what she's up to, to try to get her friend in there for another 12. So if she's elected, that's what she's going to try to do, and I'm going to try to stop that. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Eddie, for your And efforts. I didn't use the mic. Thank you, Ron, for yours. A couple of great guys in Nevada. I think people need to understand that the mayor's uh, position and the city council is nonpartisan. But if you don't know who Hillary Sheevy is, take a look at some of her Facebook pictures standing next to Hillary Clinton. I was standing next to Trump, though. Yeah. Hey! But I do listen to both sides. Don Folsom brought his Trump pen sign. I had a question for Ron. Real quickly, where do you see the direction of the state going if we don't get Republicans back in the majority and poor Jim has to sit there and fight the rest of the crew? Where do I see it going? To hell. Uh, um, I, I'm serious. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter, uh, perfect daughter, perfect wife, and perfect mother-in-law, and... I don't really need all this, but like many of you, like all of you, I'm doing this for my daughter and for our future, for our grandchildren and so forth. She doesn't have those yet, and she won't for another 10 years, but um, I, I'm doing it for the future because if someone doesn't do what you suggested and actually start to rein things in timely, if we let it get further out of control, it'll be awfully hard to ever recover it. So uh, the, the Democrats basically have a two-year horizon. What's next election look like? We have a two-generation horizon where we're asking, uh, what's it look like for our children and grandchildren? And what we need are some serious, limited government, conservative Republicans to take back the legislature, to, take, uh, to keep all six executive offices, and uh, maybe even some good limited government conservative judges. Thank you. Now, I've got one now, more question oh, for uh, Eddie, ahead. probably a city matter, but uh, RTC misspent $1.4 million on uh, double billing uh, last year. And we haven't heard one more word about it since then. Yes, that was 1.6, actually. Oh, and sorry. it was an inside job. And I mentioned that to a council member, and they told me it's weird how they make giant issues out of nothing and then issues they don't talk about because that's a Gazette Journal at work. But we ended up, the thing about it, they recovered 800,000 of it, I guess. Well, where's the trail? Where's the report on where the rest went? They don't talk about any of that stuff. So 
you know, they're on the right trail. It had to be an inside job. But if there's 800, who took it? Who, who'd they find that did it? And these are the things they bypassed. Just like another misspending thing was when I caught them in the open meeting law violation through the attorney general is now Hillary and Jessica found a way to use the city as their personal piggy bank when they subsidized Jessica's client $3.6 million out of your sewer fund money, and it was illegal for NRS. 278B, it clearly states the money can only be taken out of that for to increase capacity, not for storm drain capacity, sewer capacity. And then I called them on it, and then, of course, the city attorney messes up all the time, Carl Hall, and he had said, I think we're all, I said, you did an open meeting law violation. They do all the time, but I want to make a point on this one. And he said, I think we're okay on this. I said, well, we'll see about that. So I filed a, uh, a complaint with the attorney general, and he's in an election cycle, so he chose not to do very much. But he went with me, so I got the decision. They ended up violating the open meeting law violation. So they went under the radar, got your $3.6 million after you just had a sewer rate increase, I might add. And they subsidized a developer, which never happens. Three point six million on his project. He already bought the land. He stuck with it, and they found a way to take money out of your coffers after that sewer rate increase. So that's how they work it down at the city. So now they use this for their piggy bank. But there's three point six million, and then in the end, the attorney general didn't do anything about it and take action except for side with me. So I'll be looking out for you. Before we go on to other things it's great and they're mentioning ron byra eddie all these candidates don larry janie they're all running again okay or potentially running again but it's nice to come to meetings like this but you need to get your fannies out to the gop volunteer help walk help whatever you can do and get people elected or we go down the tubes you know don't blame anybody but yourselves if you don't get involved just a reminder too if you want your voice heard make sure you attend the precinct meetings oh i'm sorry yeah. well except i want you to know you without being there and you can't vote And the biggest thing, like Eddie said, is get your neighbors one-on-one -on -one and vote. What do you have, Jennifer? Oh, no, no, she's next. We haven't forgot Liz. This is Liz Honor for the GOP. She's, gonna, uh, she's in charge of the caucus and precinct meeting. Carolyn's going to help her, and then Carolyn always talks like I do. She'll have something else to say. Anyway, Liz Arnold is the Washoe GOP caucus and precinct that's coming up March 3rd, right? Thank you, Ray. Um, I'm just going to start this clipboard right over here. I'm here to ask for people to help me make sure that we turn out all of our Republicans in every precinct so that we can have 2,000, over 2,000 people on the Central Committee and get um, all of our candidates elected to follow up with what Ray is saying. We need to get people involved, and the caucus on March 3rd is the way to do that. You guys are already on my list. Are you? Okay. I'll go over here. Anyway, I don't know how many people here know what the caucus is really for when it's not a presidential year, um, but this is where the business of the party is conducted. This is where you decide whether or not you want to be a delegate at the convention, and also whether you want to be uh, on the Central Committee. You can talk about platform positions and record those for, for um, the convention as well. But we need people to be involved, and I also need people to help recruit people to come and show up and all that stuff. And the clipboards that I'm passing around are where you can sign up, and if you have any questions, you can see me after, because I know everybody wants to go home. That was short and sweet. It's really important. The next one, Cole, where are you? Cole is going to talk about Lincoln Day dinner that's coming up February the 16th, and so is Carolyn. They're going to pass out some stuff.
Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead, and if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmenisclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.